Hi everyone, this is Jerry from Onyx Pages. Uh, so, we have got another buddy read uh, with Alicia from Pretty Brown Eyed Reader, um, and I'm super excited about that. Uh, but first, before we get into the buddy read, I wanted to uh, review Binti Home. Uh, so Binti Home is the second edition in a trilogy by Nnedi Okorafor that follows Binti, a young woman who has gone off to university um, to follow her dream to become a harmonizer and it, who in this edition has come back home. Um, hence the title Binti Home. So if you have not uh, watched our first buddy read video I would encourage you to do that because it gives you the prequel to this book and tells you a little bit more about the plot um, but what I'm gonna do is just go through the seven calorie shell rating of Binti. So um, for those of you who are new to the channel if you don't know what the seven calorie shell rating is I do have a video uh, that takes you through the different criteria that I look for when I read a book and it tells you how I rate books so you can pause this video and go there and take a look also before I get into the rating and I have to get better at this if you do like this video please press like and if you're not subscribed to this channel, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to this channel. Uh, and in addition to that, since this is a buddy read with Alicia from Pretty Brown Eyed Reader, I hope that you will also subscribe to her channel if you are not already subscribed because she is brilliant and fun and reads a lot of amazing books that are different to what I read. And I think that you should be a subscriber to her channel like I am. Okay, so... Um, so that's, I told you a little bit about the synopsis of Binti. It is a novella. Um, she's coming home. And what happens when she comes home? And she finds out a little bit about who she is. So um, the first of the seven calorie shells that I look for is plot. And I would give plot a full calorie shell. Uh, I would give Binti a full calorie shell for plot. Um, because we... Uh, Okorfor gets a lot done. Uh, in the few pages of this novella, we do have an amazing climax. I think that we have a couple of climaxes. Um, the story takes us through a number of different environments and relationships between Binti and other people in her community, but also other people uh, just sort of in, in the galaxies without spoiling too much. So I think the plot was great. I definitely had a couple of moments where I felt really sad, that I felt really joyful. I think I got close to a tear at one point, um, and it ended on a cliffhanger, so a full carry shell um, for that. And I, I really love uh, Okorafor's writing. I think that she um, has a really amazing skill to take us, transport us to different places, and to convince us that the worlds that she's building are actually potentially real. Um, so for the second Cowrie shell, I look for character. Um, how are the characters, how are they developed, and what do we learn about those characters? So I think that in, I would give half a Cowrie shell for characters. Uh, we definitely learn a lot about Binti in uh, Binti Home. So we learn about where she's from, we get to meet her family, we learn about uh, what she is, um, about her skills and her talents, and we learn a little bit about what motivates her. Uh, but we don't learn that much about other characters. And of course, Binti is the center of the Binti trilogy, so who else would we learn about but her? But I definitely was left feeling like I wanted to get more information about some of her friends, about her companions, uh, and the community that she came from. So there was, uh, I was definitely left wanting more. Uh, and I'm hoping that the third book, Binti, The Night Masquerade, will help us uh, with some of those questions. So half a carry shall for characters. The next uh, carry is world building, and I would give a full carry shell for world building. Uh, Okorafor is an exceptional world builder, and there are so many things I love about um, the different places that she takes us to. So we've got Earth. We've got within Earth a community that's very, very Earth-bound, that spends a lot of time um, sort of kind of navel gazing, kind of trying to perfect their own society. We've got that particular community um, 
in it involved in an antagonistic relationship to another community that's also earthbound and then we've got people who live in the desert who may or may not have a relationship with otherworldly beings and then we've got this university that's full of um, intergalactic uh, beings and other kinds of species we also have um, um, like I don't want to spoil it but we also have like vehicles that may or may not be alive uh, and sort of just different kinds of ways of living and interacting different species interacting and uh, I really really love that the world is really consistent um, I wasn't left feeling like um, there were gaps in how the world was created or how the world was explained um, and it was believable to me so I would give a full carry shelf for world building um, for Afrofuturism now this is becoming a little bit more controversial for me as I learn more about um, different perspectives on Afrofuturism but um, at this point Afrofuturism in my view um, is a category uh, or a set of principles that can be applied to different kinds of art forms and in this case we've got a, sci a true science fiction slash fantasy story about a young woman named Binti. Um, she is African. Um, she is a, a, a young woman who is futuristic but even within her own time period she is also encountering um, a, sort of a, a knotting or knitting together of an ancestral past and an extraterrestrial past and also uh, a future that involves different species on different planets um, and I think that that's really cool I also think that it's also really Afrofuturistic to have uh, a young girl who's really comfortable with technology um, and becomes even more comfortable with technology as the plot develops and um, that that is the essence of Afrofuturism. So there's a full carry shell uh, for Binti Home for being Afrofuturistic. Um, queer. Uh, for this category, I'm looking at whether or not there are queer characters, whether there's a queering of um, the topics that are being discussed, whether heterosexuality is considered the, the norm, is it questioned, um, and in this case I would give half a cowrie shell um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the characters from the perspective of this cowrie shell so queerness is that there um, there are transgender characters um, characters that don't have or that aren't sexed at all um, and so I appreciated that for sure uh, but I also feel like um, those Mm. those characters are more associated with the world outside of Binti's home but in terms of her own community there are some very rigid gender norms and expectations of heterosexuality so um, it would have been nice to see even that being uh, disrupted a little bit um, but I'm not mad at it I really enjoy that there is a transgender character and um, that there is also a character that doesn't have a sex although that character is like a legit alien so meh um challenging norms um so in this criteria what i'm looking for is sorry about the light i'm i'm filming this on my laptop um challenging norms i definitely think that uh this is a uh, uh a story that challenges norms. I think the most obvious norm that this story challenges is the fact that young African girls um, can be, you know, exceptional in science and technology um, and math, right? And um, we are seeing uh, a continuation of the excellence of young African women in STEM research, and I, I feel like this um, this book sort of gets us there. And we've got a young woman who literally has a very intimate relationship with with math and science and technology it, it's almost spiritual and I, I think that that is um, I think it's totally amazing and I think it, it challenges some of the beliefs that we have about um, 
young African women, in particular continental African women, and their ability to grasp um, these concepts, and not only that, but to, to build forward from these concepts. So I think that that uh, definitely challenges a norm. But I, mean, I think the norm, um, the expectation that these young women can't do that is really problematic. Um, and then finally, is this aspirational? I would give a full cowrie shell for aspirational because um, Binti is the story of a young woman, African woman with a dream. She wants to know who she is. She wants to change the world. She believes that she has skills that um, can assist in the development of her community and other communities. And if that's not aspirational, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what is. I am uplifted by this story and I wish that girls could read stories like this all the time so 100% aspirational I don't know um, how many calories I think we're either at five and a half or six but I will put them up somewhere over there um, and that is my uh, calorie shell rating so I'm gonna pause this video thank you very much for um, watching it thus far and uh, after the little break you will see the buddy read with myself and Alicia from pretty brown eyed reader okay thanks very much thanks for watching onyx pages and I will see you in my next video um. So today we will be discussing Binti Home by Nindy Akoafor, <laughs> and I am Alicia from Pretty Brown Eye Reader. And I'm in Jerry Damali Sojourner Campbell from Onyx Pages. <laughs> We're very excited, oh. clearly. Yes, we are. <laughs> so do you mind doing a, um, a brief summary of Binti Home? Sure. Um, okay. So in Binti Home, we follow the protagonist, Binti, uh, who is a young woman who um, in Binti, the first book, which we, um, which we talked about, um, she's, coming, she's coming home from spending some time at an intergalactic uh, university. Uh, she is coming home changed and she is encountering her family and her community for the first time since coming home changed um and in this novella we follow her sort of coming home we have to deal with uh how she reckons with her family she didn't leave uh in the best circumstances she kind of disappeared uh one morning so she's coming home to a lot of stuff a lot of drama mm -hmm. uh, so this this uh this novella uh the second in the trilogy of the binti trilogy tells us a little bit about what happens when she comes home and um, and takes us through the next sort of steps of her uh, evolution as she figures out who she was and who she is and potentially who she will become. Okay, that's a great summary. Didn't give away anything, but gave a good, <laughs> I tried. good idea of what happens. I'm so bad at <laughs> I'm like, and then, and then this happened. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> so what was your first impression of the book? Just think, uh, just quick, just yeah. nothing in depth, but just your first impression. I'm just breathless. Like I loved it. I loved mm -hmm. it. It was, it was challenging um, for reasons I'm sure mm -hmm. we will get into. It was challenging, but I just loved uh, yes the different environments that we got to see. So we got to see her on the ship coming back home. Um, we got to learn a little bit about her family, her community, how it's organized. Um, we got to mm -hmm. see her life before running off, which we didn't get to see in the first mm -hmm. book. Um, we get to see the development of a friendship um, with Oku. And then we get to find out more about her origins. Um, and I just, I really could identify with that. So um, my, my first impression was that I really enjoyed being taken through all of these different settings. And I'm a people person and I love relationships. And there was just so much intimacy, so much conflict, um, so many people uh, in this one that uh, I, really, I really enjoyed the, the different population she had to, to engage with so um and we see a little bit of her attitude and i appreciated that as well yeah. 
Well, my first impression was Binti goes through a lot. I mean, just from what she went through at university and then, you know, her travels and then even at home, it was even a lot that she went through. <laughs> so that was my, my impression. Was like, man, this is a roller coaster in a short amount of pages. She's been through a lot. Yeah. So that was like my, my first impression of, of the story. So let's just jump on into it. Okay. What did you like best about this novella? What did I like best about it? Um, uh-huh. I think the thing that I liked best about it was getting to see the different creatures. Um, and so, for example, mm-hmm. the lake, the lake scene was really beautiful. So um, there will be spoilers. I don't know how to say it without spoilers, but Oku. We learn a little bit about Okwu and the different creatures that Okwu is related to. And mm-hmm. so I really liked, there's this one particular scene involving a lake and I found that really, really beautiful. And I feel like we see Okorafor's love of nature um, being expressed in this, in this book. So I think uh, the scenery, her description of the desert, um, I really, really enjoyed. Okay. What about you? Well, I have several things I want to talk about that I like. I liked her use of foreshadowing. And um, I had a couple of examples that I, um, but I don't have the book with me. So Um, it was when her professor, yeah, but I, I didn't even write the page number down on this, but it was when the professor was warning her about traveling that she was weak. Do you remember? I'm, I'm not sure what page number that was. I do remember. So it kind of set us. Go ahead. Up for something to know that something was going to happen with Binti. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then. Um, the owl. I'm trying to. I don't want to give away exactly. But when the owl. Was in the story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Arya, she said, that's not an owl. And it was like toward the end of a chapter. And it lets you know, oh, something deep is about to go down because this this thing you think is an animal is not really an animal. And you're going to find out something more intense. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I thought those two examples of foreshadowing were really good within the book. Yeah. Well, within the novella. And then also what I liked was the titles of the chapters. Mm-hmm. I I don't think I paid attention in Binti about the chapter names or even they, if they were named. Yeah, and so that those chapter names were just kind of like really set the, the tone. Like the one of the titles was "Humans Always Performing," and I know it was part of a conversation within that chapter, but the whole chapter wrapped around that that title, and it was so appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I like to look at the chapters and just read all the chapter titles as though it's like mm-hmm. a poem and then see what they have to reveal to us. Yeah. Okay. What's their table of contents? I don't, I can't remember. No, I don't think so, um, but I could be wrong. Okay. I don't think there was, but I mean, it's, is it a spoiler if I read the chapter titles? I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> Let me see. I don't have them um, tabbed off, but... Okay. Maybe a few of them. So yeah. Uh so we start with so it's Binti Home and then Humans Always Performing. hmm And then At Home. Okay, yeah. The Root. I have my tabs everywhere. Night Masquerade. That was that was freaky. Blood. Yes. <laughs> Destiny is a delicate dance. Mm-hmm. I love that one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Lies. Mm-hmm. Gold people. I wrote that one down too. <laughs> 
which is actually the name of the daughter of uh, uh, some friends of mine. Oh, she had her second birthday, hey girl. Um, and then initiative. That was the last one. Okay. Yes, I love the chapter titles. They were just really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's it's funny because it's sort of they they break the tempo a little bit and sort of get you ready for what's coming up next. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, when you read them all together, it kind of asks, you know, gets me at least to ask some questions about what, what's really important in the story. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a way of focusing your attention. Yeah. One of the things that I really liked about this story is how, um, and this is something that, I feel when I read a lot of science fiction that's Afrofuturist, um, mm -hmm. the relationship between the ancient and the futuristic. And so, and what I, what I really, I'm, I'm really starting to appreciate this about Nadia Okofor's work because I've read, I read actually another of her books this weekend. Um, and she talks about prejudice and um, stereotypes and judgment. Mm -hmm within mm -hmm. African communities. So um, nice. African Americans making, um, having prejudicial beliefs about um, diasporic Africans from the Caribbean, continental Africans, um, and, and the different kinds of continental Africans that we might encounter. So people who have gone away and come back, or people who live in the city versus who live in the desert or live in the villages, like all of these intra, conflict, intra-community conflicts, um, I find that really great. And so there's a moment in the book where we have to face that. We have, or Binti has to face mm -hmm. everything that she's learned from her family right. about a particular community, um, learning that that community is backwards. And then she has to reckon within herself uh, with the truth of that community and as a result, the truth about herself. And I feel like I've had similar moments where, oh, yeah. I, yeah, where I'm just like, I, I mean, for me, grew up in Canada, learned particular things about, um, in my family, like what it means to be Trinidadian and what it means to do things differently from the way things are done back home. And then actually traveling to Trinidad and realizing that, young people who grew up in Trinidad were much more advanced, much more um, wise about the world compared to me. And I thought it was the other way around because I grew up yes. in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. And similarly, when I traveled to, to Ghana and meeting young people, people younger than me who are far more sophisticated than I was and who knew far more about global politics and technology than I did. And right. um, I had to come into contact with my own stereotypes about um, the different experiences and intelligences of Africans around the world based on what I believe to be true about living in North America. And um, we see a little bit of that. And I like that as she, as she realizes these things, people are gentle with her, um, even though she's kind of forced to admit and she's humbled by it. I feel like she's not, she's not punished for her beliefs um, but she learns very quickly to get over them and be open to new lessons and new stories about her own origins. And I, I really appreciated that about this, about Binti Home. Okay. You kind of touched on a question I wanted to ask toward the end, so I'm kind of debating. Should we go ahead and just jump into it right now? Um, I think we'll, okay. just to mix it up a little bit. Um, when we talk, uh, just from reading Binti, you know, um, you mentioned about the universal experiences of black women. And um, to me, she re-emphasized that in this book. And I had actually wrote down about colorism and classification amongst African people. Mm -hmm. That was my thing. I was going to talk, talk about that universal experience. Like in this book, we had the old people versus the new people. We had desert people. Um, versus the Himba, and they were, you know, one was considered to be less sophisticated and one was more sophisticated and all that. Yeah. And then um, 
womanhood, like societal expectations mm. that Minty was expected to be one thing, but she has to do this journey. And we find out she's supposed to do this journey during this, you know, Benty home thing, but we all have some type of journey to get to our womanhood, you know, but it just may look different than what we think. Yeah. Oh, I have, go ahead and jump, jump right in. <laughs> I have so much to say about that. I think, um, okay. you know, and, and, and for, um, so for me, uh, I really, I really identified, and I think I might talk about this in my own like personal review of the book. Okay. I really, I really identified with the rites of passage that she has to encounter. Mm -hmm. And I, until you mentioned it, I didn't really think about, I didn't have words really to put, to put to this, like this idea of this universal moment of womanhood. Um, because like, she has a, she has a choice, right? Like she, she knows that, um, that her community expects that she is going to go through a number of rights in order to become, mm -hmm. uh, a Himba woman, right? Like that. And so she's prepared for it. Um, others are prepared for it. People challenge her her ability to actually go through and perform those those rights she understands that in order to as you say move to the next step of womanhood she has to do these things mm -hmm. and it's all like it's all predestined right like she's right. she's being taken to do these things women before her women after her will do these things but then there's this other experience that's completely out of the ordinary um, that she mm -hmm. doesn't understand, that others kind of don't really understand. Um, and she's, she's different, right? And I have to say, like, for me, the metaphor in my own life was coming out, like coming out in terms of my own sexuality and noticing that the reality of that was that I had this one path of, like, girlhood to womanhood, that I, I was expected to kind of go through. And then I had this other path that I didn't, I didn't know what that would look like. And nobody in my family, in my community could have prepared me for it. And um, there's a very specific physical change that happens to her in the first Binti that mm -hmm. she starts to reckon with. And I feel like there is an element of queerness to her experience, not necessarily in terms of her sexual orientation, but literally physical changes in her body right. that people can't really understand. And I feel like that I, I could identify with. And I really enjoyed that Okorafor doesn't provide us with a lot of explanations of what this change actually means. We still have to follow Binti as she comes into this understanding of what this change means for her. Um, mm -hmm. As opposed to stories where the protagonist knows what kind of change they're going through because somebody has like told them, this is now going to happen. You're going to be different. It's going to feel like this. People are going to do this to you and that to you. She has no clue what this means. Right. And I just, um, I really appreciate, I appreciate that. And so I feel like, in some ways we're presented with this breach, like this different kind of womanhood. Um, I feel like it's a challenge to this universal womanhood because the women that she ends up with later are not like the women that she's supposed to be. Like physically, they don't have the same customs. They don't, they don't espouse the same values. And I like, I like that we see lots of different expressions of womanhood in this story. Right. Well, one expression that I kind of picked up on was um, Binti is almost like that mad black woman <laughs> because throughout the book, she uses like anger and she talks about her nostrils flaring. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so we're going to be the mad black woman <laughs> in this, this novella. And I understand this part of what happened to her and Binti is the reason why she's upset because she has this thing that she didn't ask for that was done to her and that has made her angry and yeah. it shows up in Binti home. So Alicia, can we talk about this now? Because <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> remember how 
in the in our first conversation, there was this like realization, like, yo, like she was violated, right? Yeah, see, I didn't catch that the first time. And so when I read it this time, and I'm like, oh my God, this really had an effect on her. Yeah, and I'm just like it, it's subtle, but it I mean the 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 words that um Core 4 uses lets you know that she's having some anger issues about this thing. But go ahead, we can talk about it. <laughs> Let's go ahead and talk about it. <laughs> I just, I'm uncomfortable. Like I'm uncomfortable. Okay. Because right. like there's this whole story that we are not getting to talk about. Like it's not, I don't feel mm-hmm. like we deal with it at all. Like mm-hmm. And you know what? And, I know that you're I know that um you're finding your way into the science fiction genre. I am. Yes. <laughs> I do have a plan for you. <laughs> uh, but I know but I feel like there's a lot of stories. Like there's a there's a trope, there's like an alien abduction trope, right? And that mm-hmm. when when whenever someone is taken away, it's something happens to them that's not by their consent we then have to deal with what the, what the consequences of that are, right? Like, right. how do they deal with the trauma? How do they reintegrate back home? How do they deal with the fact that people blame them for what happened for them, to, what mm-hmm. happened to them, right? Um, and I, I do feel like we don't, we, we sort of, we see Binti getting blamed and being treated as though she chose this change. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's this moment with her and her mother that I almost cried at. Right. Was it at the station when they were at the, when she first came home at the like platform? It was. Go ahead. I'm just interrupted because that scene kind of messed me up a little bit. Okay. Let's talk about that. Because it it almost, you know, they noticed the thing that something was different about it, but they kind of like brushed it off and didn't want to talk about it in depth. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like some of the foreshadowing that that you're talking about is because, you know, we know that someone's going to have a conversation with somebody about the change, right? Um, Mm -hmm. But there's this one moment, and it's very very quick. It's between her and her mom. It's just the two of them there. And I feel like in that moment, um, you know, she kind of says, you know, I didn't like, I didn't choose this. Like, mm-hmm. what would, you, what would you have had me do? Like, I didn't have mm-hmm. options, you know? Right. Um, it's not like I volunteered. And, um, and I, 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 I think that, that, that is something that I, it's certainly something I can identify with, but I, I, I do think that people who um, have experienced various forms of violence, um, that we sometimes find ourselves in a situation where, you know, someone's like, how could, how could you let that happen to you? Mm -hmm. And we're like, I didn't let nothing happen to me. I just survived. Like, right. So. And that's exactly what she did. She had to survive to get off that ship. She already seen what, you know, what would happen if she couldn't, didn't survive against them. The Medusa. So I just, I'm, tr- I'm, I think that's a thing that it's still, I don't know if um, Binti Night Masquerade, which obviously we're going to be buddy reading, um, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> we're in this together, Alicia. <laughs> but I, I mean, I don't know if that's going to get resolved, but I'm kind of sitting here like, can she get a break? Like, can somebody just give her a hug? Like, <laughs> She went through a lot. <laughs> that was my thing. When I finished, I was like, man, I've been to go through a lot. Yes. So, I don't know. I just... It would be nice if she gets some some happiness in the third one. <laughs> you know? Or, like, just... I mean, I do think that she, that there is... I, I like that she is held, right? Like, I like that there are people who are like, I... We got you. You're here. Right. We know what you are. You'll figure out what you are, your home. Like, th- there is an element of that that we sort of right. see. But, um, yeah, it's slow coming. Anyway, that's a very long answer to your question. Um, what did you think about me? <laughs> I think we started talking, was it the universal womanhood question that you were asking? Is that how we got Yeah, and then I, I went into about the um, mad black woman yes. thing. And, yeah. Yeah, like, 
the, the unspeakable rage. She was like, listen, I just like, yeah. I literally want to like set something on fire. And I yeah. don't know why. I can relate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's talk about what we didn't like about mm. the novella. <laughs> I think you're going to be shocked by my answer. Okay, go. <laughs> the quickness of the novella. <laughs> you know, last time I said, oh, it was wonderful. It's, this time I say, no. <laughs> Let me get some examples and talk about it. <laughs> mm. Like, um, in the beginning, the character Hoffa, Hoffa was a transgender character that it was brushed by. I, I had to go back and read it. And I was like, okay, but why did you brush over? I mean, you've thought enough of it to put it in the story, but you don't expand on it and tell me anything about this character. Just but literally, she flips off the scene. Literally. You know? And I was like, literally flips off the scene and I was like why this sounds so interesting why did you just put this little sentence and if you're not careful you would brush right by it and then have the the character flip off and I was like no I want to know about this character okay why why (laughs) so to me the quickness this time just didn't work because I was like, I want to know about that. Don't give me little stuff like that and then just leave me. Mm-hmm. So okay. that, was, that was one of the things I didn't like this time. All right. I and that. it was like, uh, yeah. Huh? I did have another thing and it was um, some of the stuff was a little too much science fiction to me, like the ship giving birth. I was like, oh. <laughs> The ship ain't gonna give birth. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't do this. <laughs> but um, those are the two things that just. <laughs> those are my two things. Now, are you shocked about me saying that the yep. quickness was too much? Okay, hundred percent. You're basically saying you wanted more. Yeah, and I'm I'm very happy with that. <laughs> Um, I, yeah. just, I, I was like, don't give me little stuff that to me would add more to the story if you just go ahead and flesh it out. But yeah. that just quickly just throw something in and it's like, oh, that sounds good. And then they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did wonder about that character and why we were introduced right. to the character and then the character disappeared. And I mean, that's the interesting thing about a trilogy, right? Like, are we going to see yeah. this character again? Um, True. If there's something more. Uh, mm-hmm. And I also like, I had a really interesting reaction to that character because Ooh. at first I thought the character was a boy. Like, so I, I was thinking along a gender binary, it's either a boy or a girl. Right. And mm-hmm. at first I thought, I thought um, the character was a boy. And then that just when they're just by the, the way that the mannerisms were being described, and then I thought it was a girl. And then I thought it was a boy. And then there was the explanation. And this happened over like a, only two pages or something. Um, yeah. And I just realized how, how much work I still need to do around thinking about gender as though it's just a binary, right? It's just uh, boys mm-hmm. or girls or anything like that. And I really liked the description of this character. But I think I, w- I definitely would have liked to hear more. Um, right. Especially because when she goes home, like gender norms are so very rigid in, mm-hmm. her, in her community. Um, and, you know, again, the queerness of her experience, right? And it's not even, mm-hmm. it doesn't seem like it's strange when we hear the way that she responds to her, her friend. Um, it's not like her friend is weird. This is just who her friend is. Um, mm-hmm. And where would somebody who grew up in an environment with such rigid gender norms, where would that person be able to develop such a sense of like, you know, inclusion, like where would that happen? Um, So I thought that was, I definitely thought that was interesting. And I like, um, you know, I, this isn't the first ship, the the first live ship that I've seen. Um, Mm. 
and I, I'm actually quite, I'm intrigued by um, spacecraft that's alive or animate. So N.K. Jemison in The Stone Sky has us um, encountering a space, a, a vehicle that's actually an animal at the same time. And Octavia Butler also has us encounter buildings and vehicles that are alive um, in her uh, Lilith's brood. And then in Binti Home, we're seeing that. So I've seen that in a number of different books, science fiction books. And I think one of the things that that gets me thinking about is like um, speciesism and how like if we think of our vehicles as if our vehicles are actually animals that are and like we do have animals that are vehicles right like people yeah. use donkeys and oxes and horses um mm -hmm. dogs on sleds like we do use animals as vehicles and i and those animals like do give birth right like it's so in, ter in terms of this being a huge leap it's not that much of a leap but like what does it mean though like because we treat our vehicles as things that serve us they're just there to get us from a to b and then we park them and that's it and then when they're done we discard them and trade them for something better when we have vehicles that are alive that do give birth like then we have to start thinking about like what the cost is of our travels in a way that's a little bit different, right? So what does it mean for mm -hmm. me to, to have been traveling in a pregnant vehicle? Like how, like what does that mean for how we should, how we would treat this vehicle that's now giving birth and, and how do we, how do we deal with different levels of like, at like um, animate beings or beings that have, um, um, like, do they have, does a ship have a soul? Like, is it, does it deserve to be free? Is it enslaved? Did it, is its baby going to be a vehicle just living to help people get from A to B? Like, I, I think it, it raises a lot of interesting questions, but it, I can see, I can see you being like, ships don't have babies, so. No, <laughs> I, I wasn't thinking in like that term. But thank you for enlightening me on that. I'm just like, I, I guess I'm literally thinking like a spaceship, what we would think of, you know, for a human to go somewhere in outer space. It's just steel and metal put together. So I'm not thinking in terms of a living, a living being. Yeah. It's a human, a living being. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. I am learning a lot. I'm, I'm really getting into the science fiction thing. Listen, I, <laughs> so I, what did you like? Oh, uh, wait, was it like or dislike? Are we on dislike? I'm sorry, dislike. dislike? What, what didn't you dis what didn't you like? I think we talked about it already. Um, it's, it's more of a discomfort. Like I'm, I'm uncomfortable yeah. with how easy it is to forget that she's been severely traumatized. Like we do deal with the trauma that she, that she, watched right like she, like we, mm -hmm. do, we do deal with trauma but we right. don't we don't deal with all of the trauma that binti has had to deal with um that she's had to encounter so that that i think um i i find really difficult um and the fact that we are that she has befriended an enemy um and that she she stopped a genocide and she's like befriended an enemy and in stopping it and um she has had to accept um a very serious violence and change that's happened to her and i want i would have liked to talk more about that so that's something that i find difficult so far in the two books um what else do I, did I not like about, um, you know, I really, these aren't things that I didn't like about the book. There wasn't a lot that I didn't like about the book. I think that's probably the only thing I didn't like, but there were a number of different things about 
the relationships that that I felt quite uncomfortable about. Um, and I didn't like how she was treated by her siblings. I didn't like I didn't like like the knee jerk violent reactions to difference. Um, I didn't like how little of the university um, we were able to actually see um, in this book. I would have liked more of that. Um, but I, I honestly really enjoyed, like I enjoyed the read. So I don't really have a, a list of a lot of things I don't like. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this world develops for sure. I actually thought that um, her relationships with her siblings was pretty realistic mm. because, you know, when you have family that doesn't do anything, I shouldn't say do anything, but stays confined to an area and somebody is brave enough to leave. When that person comes back, generally they do rip into the person that has left the family mm -hmm. because they don't understand the experience that that person has went through because they can't grasp it in their mind of a life beyond where they are. Okay. And I mean, I see that, you know, in my own family, people in my community, probably, I mean, I wouldn't say we had a violent experience, but like when I went off to college, I'm the first person to go out the family. And then when I come back, it's awkwardness because they don't know how to deal with me. And they think that, you know, I may know stuff that they or I'm going to speak to them in a way that they're not used to. Mm -hmm. So I think it does take a, a level of adjustment for, for someone that leaves the family when coming back. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of realistic, but I, I mean, <laughs> not to the point of the, the violence, but. Um, it is it's something, it's always going to be some that tension when somebody does leave. Yeah. Yeah. And then deciding, like, how much, like, what's authentic, right? Like, you in, in your experience, like, you went away, you learned things, new things. Mm -hmm. You probably, like, activated different parts of yourself that weren't activated at home. But mm -hmm. you probably brought parts of Alicia from home that will always be Alicia to this other environment. And so, you know, how long will it take for people, how long will it take for people to trust the new person who's come back? Right. And those questions right. of authenticity and, um, can we trust who you are? Are we safe with you still? Or are you, mm -hmm. do you have judgments about us? Yeah, right. now that You've gone out into the, the big world. Right. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that, that definitely like home is tough, right? Like home, the concepts of home um, that come up in this story are, I do think are, some of them are quite universal. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. I can appreciate that. Okay. Um, well, let's keep going then. Did you have any favorite passages? I have some, if you'll help me out. I did write down page numbers for those. Okay. <laughs> oh, let's good. See, let's see your page numbers. Okay, uh, page 41. Let's see if we have the same pages marked. Okay. Okay. <laughs> For 41. Uh-huh. Do you want me to, um, what is it, do you want me to read it? What does it start with? Um, it's when the therapist is talking and giving advice, and it starts out with when you face something. I just put when you face dot, dot, dot. Okay. So okay. I'm not even sure where on the page it is, but it's page 41. Um, when you face your deepest fears, when you are ready, she'd said, don't turn away, stand tall, endure, face them. If you get through it, they will never harm you again. Right. I love that advice. <laughs> and I felt like it was something that kind of foreshadowed still too, that she's going to need to be firm in what she does, yeah. especially when she got back home. So um, I really like that advice. I, it reminded me of something that my dad did as a kid. I was afraid. I thought there was a monster under my bed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dad, 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 like screaming, screaming, screaming. And he came into my room and he said, check under the bed. And I'm like, okay, you clearly didn't hear me. There is a monster under my bed. Why would mm -hmm. you find me under my bed? And he's like, well, go check. Like, I'll stand right here. Go check. If there's a monster, then we'll have to deal with it. But if there's no right then you know that there's no monster so he just mm -hmm. stood there and i'm like this man doesn't love me <laughs> and like, i went and i looked under the bed and like 
there was no monster. And he's like, okay. And so we talked about the fact there's no monster and I went back to bed. And then as I, you know, as, as I grew up, there were times in my childhood that I was like, I think there's a monster under my bed. And I went under and I looked and there wasn't a monster. Um, mm-hmm. And so that, that idea of like you, you know, courage is not like that, that quote, courage is not the absence of fear, but it is the ability to act through fear. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I do like that, that quote. And I do like that. I like that she was in therapy. Like, you know, to my last point where I was like, they didn't deal with the trauma. I mean, that's, I guess that's, that's uh, one way that I'm incorrect because she did go to therapy and she did learn about her emotions and what she could do in the face of um, having a panic attack or um, having to deal with like the flashbacks of Mm -hmm. different aspects of her, of the violence that she encountered. Right. Yeah. What, what's your next uh, favorite passage? Um, It's page 60. Okay. Okay. And it starts with the Medusa worshipped. Okay. The Medusa worshipped water as a god, for they believed they came from it. This was the root of the war between the Medusa and the Kush. Though the details had long been blasted away by violence and death, and then angry, most likely incorrect, tales of heroism or cowardice, depending on the teller. I like that because, you know, no matter if it's a war between countries or war between friends or family, generally the real details of it are lost anyway. Mm -hmm. It's like the retelling of what supposedly happened is where the war continues to to be raged. And I just love that, that quote. It was just so much for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have more? (laughs) No, you're right. No, I just had those two. Those two? Yeah, I had those two. I have a lot of stickies, but I'm not, some of them are about um, phrase it, like uh, passages, and then uh-huh. some are just things that I really liked. Um, let me just see. I liked the description of her home. The root. So, the root, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, my family's house has been called The Root for over 150 years. It's been in our family for longer than the existence of its name. One of the first homes built in the Himba village of Osemba, The Root was made entirely of stone. Even the bioluminescent plants growing up on the outside walls and the roof were generations old. The house was passed down through the women, and my mother, being the oldest daughter in her family and the only one born with the gift of mathematical sight, had been the clear inheritor of it when her mother passed. Um, So I liked um, the idea of like a house being passed down through many, many generations. Mm -hmm. Um, Maternally too. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I really liked that. I liked I liked how she goes on to describe the homes and the dwe- like mm-hmm. the dwellings, um, and how it's not only there for your family but also for your community and also for passersby. Mm-hmm. Um, I also like the idea of the gift of mathematical sight. Like I just I'm absolutely enthralled by Okorafor's um, use of magic as math and math as magic. Um, mm-hmm. I just like I just loved it. Like if you asked me, you know, what magical element um I appreciated most about the book, it would be her use of equations. And I remember I remember when I was in grade 10 or 11, I guess whenever we had to learn how to balance equations. I remember at the mm-hmm. end of like ba- I used to love balancing equations and I loved the like the symmetry of um like moving things from one side of the equal sign to the other. And I used to love when you finish it, you just feel so like complete. Um, and I remember that. And so, you know, her turning math basically into 
um, like a spell, like a skill that you can use in different, different equations can um, elicit different feelings and they can calm you down or they can prepare you for something uh, intimidating. Like that is just so cool. So I like that passage for that reason. And I'll just choose one more. Um, again, so this is another, um, it's another description of a dwelling. Um, the ending Zanaria lived in a vast network of caves and a huge limestone cliff. Within the bowels of these caves were winding staircases that led from cave to cave, family to family. Some caves were tiny, no larger than a closet. Others were as vast as the root. Upon arrival, I was taken for a quick tour of my grandmother's family caves. I met so many of her people, young to old, all enthusiastically waving their hands about that I could not understand the logic of where people lived. It seemed everyone could stay wherever he or she was most comfortable, from child to elder. I saw a cave where an old man and his teenage granddaughter lived, the girl's parents, one of whom was the old man's daughter, living in a cave connected by a narrow tunnel. The old man and the granddaughter were both obsessed with studying, collecting, and documenting stones, so their cave was full of stone piles and stacks of yellowing paper with scribbled research. Um, and again, like, I like descriptions of homes um, right. and dwellings, and I, I really love the idea of um, people being able to live wherever they want and however they want, and that their dwellings are their dwellings are created around their interests, right? right? So somebody who enjoys plants has a dwelling that's full of plants and they may or may not live with other family members or they may or may not live with um, a partner. Um, they might live alone or they might live alone some of the time. And so mm -hmm. the, the, the way that um, she shows us different kinds of communities in, in like in the, um, in the Ennis Naria, like I thought that was really cool compared to, the root, which is a little bit closer uh, to the nuclear family that the nuclear heterosexual family that we're, we're typically used to. Right. Well, um, I did like the name the root because when I, I heard it, it meant, uh, automatically thought about foundation yeah. and home should be your foundation. And so I thought that was a great name to have the home house called the root. I really did like that. And I also like the idea of the cave thing because it, it made me think about similar to what you said, that people come in all different sizes and shapes and families do too. So why should it all be conformed to one type of dwelling? So I, I did like both of those descriptions too. Okay. That's it for passages. There's so many. Oh, yeah, but those were just like the two that popped out at me, and I wanted to make sure to discuss those. Um, who is your favorite character in this oh, one? Um, Do you want a moment? I can go ahead and talk about mine if you... I, 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 know, I, I know who it is. Um, okay. It's, the, it's, it's a tie. It's a tie between okay. Arya and the grandmother. The grandmother is mine. <laughs> That's who I <laughs> The grandmother. <laughs> she badass. Uh, I know. Okay. But she reminds me of so many grandmothers. Okay. And I think that's what just, because, I mean, grandmothers just tell you stuff straight up and don't care how your feelings are hurt. And it's just like, she just gave her the information. It's like, you gonna deal with it. Mm. You want everything you think you know, you don't know. And that's generally like how my grandmother kind of delivered information to me. It was just like, boom, there you go. Yeah. And you know, it wasn't like it wasn't short code, it wasn't nothing like that. And you you're left to to figure out, well, why did she tell me that way? But at the same time, it gives you what you need to know to know who you are. And that's how her grandmother gave the information to her. And I was just like, that's a grandmother. I love grandmothers. <laughs> she reminds me of mine. <laughs> I loved, uh, so I, I love the grandmother for that reason as well. Yeah. And I just love how grandmas can just like, like they just kind of, because your parents are their kids, they don't have the same kind of like reverence mm -hmm. for them. 
So you'd be like, don't even, don't even listen to your father. Listen, yeah. you used to do this, this, and that, right? Like that. Right. They just mm-hmm. kind of, you know, and it's, now I didn't grow up like with my grand, my grandparents lived in different countries. And so I don't okay. have lots and lots of memories of them. Um, so, so I, I really, I think I have like this wistful imaginary world where, you know, I had more connection with my grandparents, but I definitely really liked that. I'm also an only child, so I don't even, I couldn't relate to the siblings. So that's why I like the whole family relationship stuff I found really intriguing. Um, but the Aria, um, I just loved that she was a figure from the past and then, and then somebody that, um, Binti got to meet later. And I just loved how stern she was. And she just like, Mm -hmm. you don't know anything and Mm -hmm. come into my house and, you know, like this just kind of. I'm so wise. I'm so old. You, you won't even be able to comprehend how old I am. I've got all this knowledge. I remember you. <laughs> like, finally you came back. Like, I just love that older, wiser, elder, knows the world kind of experience. I really appreciated that. Yeah. Yeah. And her Afro, obviously, like, that she's, like, also very beautiful. Um, yeah. <laughs> ageless and has this big old Afro and living in the desert in her own, like, place that nobody can get to with a bird flying mm-hmm. around. It was just beautiful. <laughs> yeah. That was good. <laughs> Did you have a favorite scene? I know you talked about the lake scene. Was that your favorite one? I had a lot of, of different ones. I, I think okay. I think I, I really like being on I like being underwater. I like swimming and I like the underwater world. Um so I just loved it when Oku was like, I'm dancing with my ancestors and yeah. she was like, I've never seen a Medusa like ha- experience joy. And mm-hmm. uh, I I like that scene because um you know I, I see them as so ruthless um, and mm-hmm. I don't really understand the physiology of the Medusa, and I don't understand how they like the emotions and how they work and anything like that. So it was just really odd to see him basically like being, or it being joyful. Um, so I, I enjoyed that scene and also just like the, the color of the lake and why the lake was that color and mm-hmm all of those and her not being able to swim, but it being salt water. Like I just loved, I loved that. Mm-hmm. There wasn't, there's also not a lot of water in the story. So yeah. Well, um, my favorite scene was anyone with the grandmother in it. Yeah. Probably when she took her away from um, the camp mm-hmm. and they were on the sand dune and she was just talking to her about her history and letting her know about herself. And I just thought that was a tender moment, but it wasn't like she was coddling her or anything. She's like giving it to her one one on one, woman to woman. This is this is what you are. This is about your people, and you need to deal with it. And so I just I, I really did like that scene, and the fact that she took her away from the group to let her have that one on one time so that she could react and and deal with what was she needed to process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. That was a beautiful mm-hmm. set of scenes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I am nearing the end. Because okay. those were like our general. I just had one more question. Okay. So did you did you learn enough about the Himba this time? No. Because last time <laughs> that was one of your problems. You just did not know enough about the Himba. So I was just wondering, did you know enough about Himba this time? No. <laughs> no. I didn't. No. I, I, I okay. mean, I, I learned more, but I'm so, I have more, it left me with more questions. It okay. left me with more questions. I want to, I want to understand the politics. Mm-hmm. I want to understand um, the different nations and how they react to each other. There are just so many classes and castes. Um, right. I'd like to learn more about that. Um, and why they're so earthbound, you know, like, so there's just so much there. 
that I'd like to learn about. So no, I didn't learn as much as I would have liked to, but I, I know a lot more. So I'm happy about mm -hmm. that. Okay. I learned enough. I mean, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Before it got any more out there, it was, I was good. <laughs> so, I, um, so the Night Masquerade, that's the, la the last one. Uh -huh. And is it coming out in January 2018? Is that, do you know? I think that's what I saw. Um, um, I'm not sure. I can look really quickly. Yeah, because I'm, I'm definitely, I wonder if we can end on the note of like, what do we want? The, like, what do we need for this trilogy to like, end well for us? Not that we'll be able to influence the content at all, but at least, oh, nope, because it's done. But, you know, is, <laughs> what do we, what do we want to see? Or maybe like predictions or something that we can take to the next buddy read. Uh, January, oh, sorry. January 16th is the release date. Okay. Okay. Um, so what needs to happen for you? in order to feel closure. <laughs> you need a ship to not have any babies. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, let's see. I would like for her relationship with Aku mm -hmm. to be more defined. Okay. Are they going to wind up being in some type of uh, romantic relationship? Or are they going to be professional? Is there something there? Okay. I kind of, I think I would, I would like to see that. Yeah. Um, maybe whether she's ever going to return back to earth or is she just going to stay at university or out doing something else. And um, really how does her family deal with her? knowing the fact that she now knows who she really is. Yeah. And what do the other siblings, do they know? Right. So I think those probably like three things I would want to, yeah. to see. Yeah. But since it's night, the, the title is night masquerade. I assume we're going to have to deal with that, which yeah. we didn't discuss a lot in this, but. And why does she? Cause I kind of feel you kind of feel like is she going to have another experience with the night masquerade? Yeah. Is that why it's titled that? So yeah. is she still going to be on earth? She's not going to go back to university. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I love, I love the idea of her being a harmonizer and okay. I'd like to sort of figure out what harmony she brings. Like what, what is she supposed to harmonize now? Um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of disharmony available to her. So she's got a lot of harmonizing work to do. So I'm, I'm curious as to what she harmonizes. Um, and I, hmm. There's, there was a really shocking ending, like a cliffhanger ending. Um, and so I, I need to, I need some answers. Right. <laughs> Um, and I just, I guess I, I feel like she has some choices to make about how she's going to harmonize all the different parts of herself, the different parts of herself that are now coming together. Um, but I think, um, in addition to that, I'd like to see her fully understand the Eden and, um, get a sense of like how it works, why it works for her, why there is a, you know, why she found it the way that she found it. Mm -hmm. at the time that she found it or why it found her at that time. Um, and I, 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 I think we'll probably be introduced to another set of beings. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to what that, what that's like and how everybody engages. Do with you her. think it will be the Medusa that we will actually see more from the Medusa and find out about them? No, I you think, don't think so. No, I okay. think it's going to be another race of beings 
Did she mention another one within this? I'm trying to. Yeah, the, so I just didn't say. I'm not trying to be coy. It's just of spoilers. Oh, okay, spoilers. okay, all like, right. Like the owl, you know. Like I feel like. Okay. 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 <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it just took a minute. <laughs> it's all good. It's all trying good. to recall. I just read. I just finished it like a couple of days ago. So yeah, I, I did last week. So it's it's kind of faded out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. So I'm complete. Did you have more um, things that you want to talk about about Binti Home? No, I'm good. I've, I've gone through my list of notes I have, and I think I got everything out. Thank you very much for facilitating. Um, I do, I oh, do no want to say that this cover, though, can we have a minute? Oh, oh that. yes, it is beautiful. It's really, really beautiful, and uh, uh -huh. yeah, the cover art is just great. I really, that's yeah. one of the things I really like about it. Um, mm -hmm. so I know that um. Okorfor is on, Nadia Okorfor is on Twitter, and um, she has, like, posted this, uh, this three-panel image of the three different covers um, for Binti. Oh, uh-huh. Um, and that's really cool. I think it's like she, you know, the first one is an African leaves home, and then an African returns home, and then an African becomes home. Um, mm. Something like that. So I just... I, I really like how she put the three together. And when this is done, I, I look forward to reading about other people's experiences um, of Binti or watching other booktubers who have read this. I hope that, I hope that people, I hope that we see more videos about Binti. Um, on right. Because I'd love to hear what people have to say about the story. And they're so like, I mean, they're so short because they're novellas. So for people who are just getting into it, I feel like it's just it's just enough to sort of insert yourself into her world. So, oh yeah. If it was much more, I don't think I could handle it. But now, you can. <laughs> now you can. I'm getting there. <laughs> it's good. Um, yeah. So I'm good. I'm good with this, buddy. Okay. I had a really good time with you. I was looking forward to it. Thank you. Oh yeah. I'm just joking. I'll be, you know, I'm on board for the third one. <laughs> that wasn't even a question. <laughs> yeah. So how are the views for the um, first, first video? I haven't been back. Are they, are people commenting on it still or? Um, yeah, I think we got a lot of comments. I think we okay. have about 116 views or something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Really, really good numbers um and it looks like people are enjoying uh, the buddy read so to people okay. who are watching this if you are if you like this um please like like on both of our um channels um yeah. if not subscribe to us please do subscribe <laughs> if there are books that yeah. you, you would like to see the two of us chat about we can we can move out of the science fiction realm then um Maybe we can um, explore some other things after we're done with Binti. Yeah. I'm game. I like to talk about books. <laughs>